right, good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Happy Monday. Um, exciting. Today is our last day of lecture, which is kind of crazy, and I sure appreciate you all being here. Today, what we're going to do is go over chapter 19, part of it. Uh, chapter 19 is over coordination compounds, which is basically just my excuse to talk about transition metals, which was the stuff I've always liked a lot. Um, some of this stuff uh, will be important. Now, chapter 18, which is the focus of next week's problems, that we'll talk about that, should be all review for you at this point. And I'm trying to kind of get your minds thinking about uh, things we've already done, so that when the final comes, you'll be good to go and take care of business. Uh, so today, we're going to look at some of the notes from chapter 19, but not all of them. And when I get to a certain point, then we'll shift over and do some review for the midterm, which I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, this Wednesday, when you come to class, uh, bring exam prep to along with you. Uh, it will be a day of review, all right? So if you have questions on things, this is going to be a great time to ask them. The floor will be open, and I'll take any questions you might have. The lab we did last week, the determination, KSP, Delta G, et cetera, et cetera, long, too long of a title to write, I apologize. That lab will be due. Uh, turn that in. And this week, finally, we'll start what I consider to be one of the two most fun labs of all. Now, fun labs may be an oxymoron to some people, I understand, but you'll see what I mean when we go there. Uh, these are the qualitative analysis labs. QA1 and next week QA3. Um, these labs are all about just finding what's in your solution, but you don't have to find amounts. So there's lots of color changes, solids appearing and disappearing, uh, stuff like that. And also, for better or worse, there's no math. Woohoo! So after the KSP lab you'll turn in this Wednesday, that's kind of a relief too. So uh, hang tight. Um, for both this lab and next week's lab, make sure that you uh, bring some safety goggles along. And also, if you're a person that wears like flip-flops and stuff like that, uh, no open-toed shoes. I've had problems in the past where people spilled stuff and it went down on their feet and it wasn't like deadly or anything but it didn't feel good so I try to make sure people wear like tennis shoes or boots and stuff like that. Now Wednesday night I'll release it a midterm two and that'll be due by Friday at nine o'clock via email. All right the format of the midterm is very similar to the first midterm. I'll talk more about midterm two on Wednesday uh, so I'll bring your questions then. so get that by nine o'clock. And then, like I said, next week, Monday, there is no class. It's Memorial Day, so the whole campus is closed. We won't have a lecture. And then a week from this Wednesday, next week, Wednesday, problem set six, which will be over this material, plus that review chapter, chapter 18, will be due. The QA lab from this Wednesday will be due next Wednesday. And finally, the QA3 lab is a lab that you will turn in on the same day. So make sure that you bring a printed copy so you can just turn it in at the end of lab and you'll be good to go. You won't have to think about labs anymore. Any questions on any of that stuff? So chapter 19, all right, uh, chapter 19 is a very fun chapter for me. My background is in inorganic chemistry with metals, and the colors of things were really fascinating to me. So any excuse I can get to talk about transition metals is awesome. Now that being said, in this class, we lost a day from Memorial Day, we lost a day to a snow day, so I'm definitely gonna do an abbreviated version. Uh, we're not gonna go through all the notes, darn it. Uh, so if you printed them off, you can see what we would have maybe talked about if we would have had time, but this will give you an idea of what's happening. We've talked a lot about complex ions in this class since the very beginning of Le Chatelier's principal lab. We'll talk more about how to name complex ions in this particular section. A coordination compound is really nothing more than a complex ion with some kind of counter ion to make it uh, solid. So for example, if you've got something big and positive, like maybe this thing, uh, you could then complex it with chloride, for example, and make a solid out of it. So we'll talk about those kind of things as we go along. Um, First thing that we need to remember here a little bit is a little bit about how electrons work, especially with transition metals. And iron going to iron plus two 
is a two electron process. The initial iron has lost two electrons, become positive two. And on the periodic table, we know the iron is number 26. So the neutral iron would have 26 electrons. This iron plus two would have only 24 electrons. But what I would like to remind you of is how to remove electrons. So uh, iron has an argon core, 4s2, 3d6. And this is kind of a good review here. Argon's number 18. And after that comes potassium and calcium, 4s electrons. So that would be 4s2. And then to get to iron, this is the beginning of the 3d group. So 3d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's where the 3d6 comes from. Now in Chem 221, we always wrote it, or most of the time anyway, as 4s2 first and then 3d6. But when you're removing electrons, you always take away from the highest n orbital. And the numbers in front are the numbers you want to look at. So for this problem, like most transition metals, the 4s, the s electrons, will come out before the d's. So iron plus two has a 3d6 configuration. It's the 4s electrons which come out first. And if you go on from there to make iron plus three, then you can start taking away the 3d's. But I wanted to point that out because almost all the transition metals, the things you see are mostly the ions, and the configuration, the behavior of them, is mostly due to the d electrons. So for iron, it would be 3d, uh, you go down to say ruthenium, it would be a 4D, etc., etc. All right, this leads us into a quick reminder about what paramagnetic means. And we saw paramagnetism in Chem 222 last when we talked about Lewis structures that had odd electrons. For a metal, uh, paramagnetic means that you have an unpaired kazutite, an unpaired electron, and you can draw out the different orbitals and stuff to see what happens. Paramagnetic species are important because their effect on magnetic fields and reactivity is pretty great. Um, this is chromium. Now, chromium, by the n plus l rule, has a 4s2, 3d4 configuration. But, if you remember from Chem 221, and it's quite okay if you don't because I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, uh, this one actually is an exception to the N plus L rule. So it actually has a 3D5 for us one, and nobody knows why it does this, but it does. But it's not important here. Each of these little arrows is an electron. And if the up electron doesn't have a down electron, then it's considered a paramagnetic metal. And chromium has actually, in the correct configuration, six unpaired electrons. So it's very, very diet, very, very paramagnetic. Paramagnetic things are attracted to magnetic fields, while diamagnetic things are not. Here's a palladium uh, atom. All right, palladium is another transition metal. But its electron configuration, which is also an exception to the n plus l rule, Notice how every up arrow has a down arrow. So up, down, up, down, up, down, etc. There's no single electrons by themselves. So this would be an example of a diamagnetic metal. So this is one, this is how you can tell officially then if something is paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Any questions? So knowing that then, we can start to look at these crazy complex ions in a little bit more detail. And we've seen actually several examples of complex ions. We saw um, the, in the Le Chatelet's principal lab, we saw how zinc, the solid, disappeared when you added more hydroxide and ammonia to it. That was a complex ion. Uh, the calcium from last week actually makes some complex ions. A complex ion is nothing more than an, a species with a charge, an ion, but it's complex because you usually have a transition metal with certain kind of anions around it. It's really uh, a Lewis acid with Lewis bases. And so that's a better way to think about really what a complex ion is. 
Now, in this section, the Lewis acid will always be a transition metal. In the real world, you could have aluminum, boron, gallium, these kind of things. But in this section, we'll pretty much look at transition metals. And then the Lewis bases, a Lewis base is just a species with a lone pair of electrons on it. So if you drew out ammonia, there would be a lone pair on the nitrogen's Lewis structure. Cyanide has lone pairs on both the carbon and the nitrogen. So either way, the Lewis acid-Lewis base comes together. It makes a Lewis acid base complex or a complex ion. So instead of having just Fe3+, which would be a simple ion, a complex ion is essentially a Lewis acid with Lewis bases around it having something with a charge. These are super product favored. The equilibrium constants are usually much greater than one, uh, as we've seen several times. And so complex ions are part of what we're going to look at in coordination chemistry. All right? A complex ion is part of a coordination complex. And sometimes people say that instead of a complex ion, it should be coordinated compound. I don't know. That's up to you. But the important part, once again, is that the Lewis acid will almost always be a transition metal, all right? Nickel and iron, chromium, zinc, etc., etc. And the Lewis base will be the other part. Now, Lewis base probably has too many syllables for simple chemists, I guess, so sometimes they refer to these as ligands. And a ligand is just another term for a Lewis base in a complex ion. So in this complex ion, the ligand would be cyanide. In this complex ion, the ligand would be ammonia. But a ligand will always have lone pairs to connect to some kind of central atom. Any questions on that? Complex ions can be positive or negative. It just depends on what else is around it. So ammonia doesn't have a charge. So the positive two of the nickel shines through in the complex ion. On the other hand, cyanide has a negative one charge. So six times negative one from the ligands plus positive three, that's where the negative three comes from. The iron is still positive, but the ion as a whole has a negative three charge. Okay. A coordination compound then is just a complex ion with something else around it. You can have two complex ions coming together. You can have a complex ion that's positive with an anion. And as we'll see, you can also have a negative complex ion with something positive. But a coordination compound doesn't have a charge, all right? A co coordination compound has a complex ion in it, but, it does, but the coordination compound is neutral. So as an example, this first one right here, this is a cobalt complex ion. And notice how there's square brackets around it. That helps the chemist to see that there's a complex ion. This particular complex ion, we know has a positive three charge because there are three negative one chlorides with it. So if there's three negative ones, that means that this must be a positive three overall. Um, this one right here is actually two complex ions put together. So remember that to make a compound, you have to have equal positive and negative charges. The first complex ion, which is this part in brackets, that's the positive part. Positive parts always go first in chemistry. So this is a copper, this is a platinum. Now ammonia doesn't have a charge, but platinum does, uh, of course, has a charge, and chloride has a charge. So this is a positive part and a negative part coming together right there. People talk in this field about a coordination number, and that's just the number of donor atoms that are connected to that Lewis acid center. So it's a coordination number can be uh, usually two, four, or six, kind of depends. Um, in this example with a cobalt we've been looking at, there are six ammonias around it, so six connections to the cobalt. So that would be a coordination number of six. 
but you can also have coordination numbers of four. So there's four chlorides, and each one of those is connected to the platinum. So the coordination number would be four. You can even have two sometimes, and we'll show examples of those. But it's the number, it's the ligands, they determine how many places they connect with the central atom. So the coordination number is usually something defined by the number of ligands, and we'll see more about this. Any questions? Okay. All these transition metals will have uh, lone pairs on them. So the reason why uh, some of them will have more or less often depends on the number of lone pairs, but we'll look into this more in detail too. Okay. So, complex ions are Lewis acids with Lewis base ligands around them, all right? And if you take a complex ion and you put it with some kind of counter ion, you make a neutral compound, and these are called coordination compounds, all right? So a coordination compound is something that, in theory, you could actually make of solid. You could say, hey, Jonah, look at this, or something like that, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, Coordination compounds are neutral. And then finally, the coordination number just depends on how many connections there are between the ligands and the central atom. So the reason why the coordination number is important is because it helps to define the geometry of the complex ion. So this is an example of a linear complex ion. Now we saw linear back in Chem 222 when we were making Lewis structures. This is how uh, transition metal scientists that study coordination compounds think about geometry. So this silver right here has two ammonias next on it. And so you can imagine like most electrons, they want to be as far apart from each other as they can. So if you have a coordination number of two, which means two places that the ligands connect to the metal, it inevitably is linear, all right? They'll be 180 degrees apart. Like you'll have one ammonia on the right and one ammonia on the left. If you have a coordination number of four, there are two possibilities, and it kind of depends on the electrons and stuff running around. Now, coordination number of four usually takes up the tetrahedral arrangement. And we saw tetrahedral in Chem 222 when it came to like alkanes and stuff like that. In this world, instead of having like carbon in the middle, you're gonna have the metal. And then around it, you'll have four ligands. So in this example, the zinc would be the blue atom, and the ammonias would be each of these red dots around it. In the second example, you'd have an iron as the blue atom, and the red dots here would be chloride. But oftentimes, these are gonna be uh, tetrahedral geometries. However, you can have lone pairs around it, and this is probably more than we're gonna get into. But if you have lone pairs, sometimes they take up positions like on the top and the bottom. So it's also not too uncommon to have square planar coordination numbers of four. And this is just an example. Here's a nickel. That would be the blue atom. And there's four cyanides around it. There are ways to tell uh, if the complex is going to be square planar or tetrahedral. We, I don't think we're going to go into that in this class, but in future classes there are ways to figure out how many electrons are around. So you're seeing here geometry, but from a, like a transition metal perspective. And for four, uh, tetrahedral is the most common, but there are some square planers out there. And in Chem 222, we didn't see hardly any examples of square planar unless it was octahedral with two lone pairs. But here in this class, uh, it's more common. The most common of all the coordination compounds, so by far, is when you have six ligands around a central atom. And when you have six ligands around a central atom, this makes the octahedral geometry. And most of the complex ions that we've seen in this class have actually been octahedral uh, when it comes right down to it. 
Notice that in this compound, the cobalt would be the light blue atom, and the darker blue atoms around it would be representing of a cyanide. So if you had six negative one cyanides running around, uh, that would be okay when you have a cobalt plus three. So in this case, it's easy to see that there are six dark blue dots and six cyanides. Cool. But on this one over here, EN is an abbreviation for something we'll talk about in a second. And we're going to see that EN, which is ethylene diamine, actually has two places to connect to the central atom. So this one, each of these ENs would be like two of the dots. So one of the ENs would be here, one of them would be here, and one of them would be here, for example. I'll show you more about this in a little bit. But when you think about coordination compounds or complex ions, octahedral is by far the most common. Any questions? Um, in this compound, I said how there's six negative one cyanides. The complex is negative three overall, and I think I made an allusion to cobalt being positive three. And I just want to kind of reiterate that you can absolutely find the charge of any of these things uh, using this kind of approach. <clears throat> if you have a complex ion, like this one here on the left, then all of the charges together will equal the charge on the complex ion. So for example, if you look at this, iron is a variable charge metal, and you don't always know what iron's gonna be. It could be positive two, positive three, positive six, blah, blah, blah. So you do know, though, that cyanide is always negative one. So I'll show you here how you can find out what the charge is on the ion. Cyanide is negative one, and there's six of them. We don't know what iron is, but we know that the overall charge is minus three. So you can think about it as six times negative one plus x, and this is the charge on the iron, and that equals the charge on the complex ion, which is negative three. So negative six, add six to both sides to get it on the other side, you'll find that x here is positive three. And that's the way to find out what the charge is on the metal. Remember, metals are all over the place and stuff, so it's hard to say. Questions what I did right there. All right. Now, this is a coordination compound, which means overall it doesn't have a charge. So in this case, if we didn't know what the cobalt was, we'd have to remember or realize Ammonia is a neutral compound, NH3. What's the charge on chloride almost all the time? Negative one, well done. So over here, the cobalt will be the X, we don't know. We have six ammonias, which are zero. It's a neutral compound like water. And we also have two negative one chlorides. And all of that equals zero. The compounds don't have a charge, all right? So it's just equal to zero. Six times zero, obviously you don't have to write it. But anyway, negative two, put it on the other side, it becomes positive two. That's a positive two cobalt. This is a neutral compound, a neutral coordination compound. This, on the other hand, is a complex ion. It's an anion. It's a negative anion. We try cation. It's positive, negative, and stuff. Any questions? Cool. So here's an example of a problem you might have. It says, what's the charge on the copper atom in this copper ammonia chloride thing? All right. Well, usually the metals are positive. So what we could do here is say, all right, X for the copper plus two ammonias. And earlier we saw how ammonia was zero, so that's pretty chill. And we also have two chlorides, which we also saw earlier was negative one. Now, does this beast have an overall charge? 
No. So you just let this equal to zero. The only thing here we don't know is x, kind of a sloppy x, looks like a lambda, but that's my, that's my problem. Anyway, x plus zero minus two equals zero. So you solve for x, positive two. Any questions on that? Okay. The ligands, like I said earlier, are really nothing more than Lewis spaces, all right? They're gonna be something with a lone pair on it. And it's the lone pair connecting to the Lewis acid which makes it possible. And like we saw in chapter 14, part one, uh, Lewis acids are usually positive. They have a place for uh, electrons to go. Lewis bases often uh, negative, or at least they have a lone pair. So <clears throat> when it comes to this section, because we're gonna see some more complex that's maybe not the best word, some more complicated examples of Lewis bases, uh, we need to start thinking about the number of places they can connect to the Lewis acid. Because in theory, if the base is big enough, uh, then it can connect in more than one spot. So I think from Latin, and I'm not a foreign language person by any means, but from Latin, dentate is a phrase that means tooth. And so chemists of this section oftentimes will think about the number of teeth, which are just the number of places that a Lewis base can connect to a Lewis acid. Now, monodentate is what we've seen mostly so far. Mono is one, that would be one tooth, one place to connect to an atom. And that's by far the most common. But in this section now, we're going to start looking at other types of Lewis base ligands that have more than one connection. So if you hear about a bidentate ligand, that means two teeth or two places to connect to an atom. And tetra would be four. These actually have four places to connect to a metal. Hexa is six. Hexadentate would be six. And sometimes they just say polydentate, which means it has two or more places. And in biology especially, you might have heard of chelating agents. Chelating agent is just nothing more than a polydentate ligand. So now we can talk about what that means. Polydentate just means it has more than one spot to connect to the metal, all right? Most of what we've looked at so far are only single teeth, like single handshakes with the metal. But these polydentate chelating agents have more than one hand they can kind of connect around. So. If you're into the Fantastic Four, which you probably have better uh, literary references than I do. But anyway, Mr. Fantastic and Scratch. And so he could have multiple places to like pat you on the shoulder or <laughs> shake your hand or this is totally dorky. But anyway, that would be one way to think about it. Okay, let me show you maybe some better chemistry examples than that one. Any questions on Okay. Monodentate, all right, by far the most common. We've seen already a lot of monodentate ligands. Water is a great one. We've also seen chlorine and ammonia, all these kind of things. There's tons of monodentates, all right? Water is great. A lot of times uh, people will refer to water in these as aqua to represent the fact that it's different from regular water. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, water is a great monodentate. Cyanide, we've seen a couple times this morning, is a monodentate. Ammonia, this is nitrite. Thiocyanide, we saw in the FESCN2 plus lab. Hydroxide, the halides like chloride we were talking about over here. These are all monodentate. And again, all that means is they all have one place they can make a connection to the Lewis acid. All right, and they're very, very common. This is carbon monoxide, oxide and stuff. Uh, we saw the ammonia complex already. This is an iron thiocyanide compound, all right? Monodentate molecules are relatively small, so they only have one place to connect to the metal atom, all right? We're gonna see now some examples of bigger dentate examples, and they have, they're bigger molecules overall, so they have more than one place to connect to a central atom. Here are some real common bidentate ligands. Now let's just back up for a second. Remember, a ligand is nothing more than a Lewis base. 
So all of these things, if you draw out their Lewis structure, and I'll show you examples of that, they're going to have more than one lone pair on them. So more than one lone pair means they can connect to the atom, maybe from like the top and the bottom, or the right and the left. So bidentate means that these all have two places to connect to a molecule. Oxalate is a weak base. We talked about it quickly in an earlier chapter, but it's not important. Oxalate is a good example of a bidentate ligand. Now here's that EN molecule. It's ethylene diamine. An amine is a nitrogen containing species and ethyl is two carbons. So this is like a two carbon system in the middle with an amine on both sides. This is a bidentate ligand because both of these nitrogens has a lone pair. And each of those lone pairs is able to make a connection with the Lewis acid in the middle. So ethylene diamine, which is abbreviated EN for probably obvious reasons, is bidentate because of the two nitrogens. Each nitrogen has a lone pair. It'll act as a Lewis base. It'll connect to the Lewis acid. This one is not as common, but it's kind of interesting. It's called orthophenanthroline, O-phen, if you're hip in this world, which you probably don't want to be. But anyway, this is another example of a bidentate ligand. And this might be like, blah, 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 blah. you have no idea what it's saying, and that's okay. All you need to know for here is that it's bidentate, and that means two places to connect to the central atom. So if you make example complexes with these, all right, they're going to take up two of the possible slots. And again, most of the metals are six coordinate, which means they like to be octahedral. So that's why in this complex, you only see three ethylene diamines, even though this is octahedral. Each of these is connecting at the, each nitrogen. So it's like two teeth are used uh, per ethylene diamine and there's six slots total. So here's a chromium with three oxalates, and again, that's another bidentate one. Um, we're gonna see the orthophenanthroline is a really big molecule. It has the two teeth, but there's just a lot of atoms. So this one usually is just one orthophenanthroline. Four ammonias, this is, this is a six coordinate iron. So when I look at these complexes, I think about, first of all, like how many spots they probably have for Lewis bases or ligands. All of these are six, and I know that because ethylene diamine is a dibidentate, so three times two is the six. This one's three times two. This one is just two spots with four monodentate ligands. Any questions? What do they look like, Dr. Russell? Oh, good, whoever said that in the back back there. Here's the Lewis structures for these different molecules. Ethylene diamine, uh, as I said, is a nitrogen on the ends, and the nitrogens have long pairs. And ethyl is two carbons in the middle. So ethylene diamine looks like that. Now, oxalate, which is found in like broccoli, stuff like that apparently, but I don't, I don't know, anyway, I'm not a nutritionist, but anyway, oxalate is a two carbon system with two double bonds and two single bonds, and if you remember about formal charges, it's the single bonds down here that will have the negative charge. Um, the red dot right there just means where the teeth are connecting to the Lewis acid. So the teeth will connect on the single bond oxygens on oxalate. When it comes to ethylene diamine, the teeth will be right here on the nitrogens. And here's this huge orthophenanthroline. It's a big molecule, but it's the nitrogens lone pairs once again that tell you where it's going to connect to the atom. This is such a big molecule that it's often only one of these per Lewis acid transition metal. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of the idea. Any questions? As the ligands get bigger and bigger, there starts to be different ways to represent them. Now, up until this point, having the atoms listed has been super important. Lewis structures, hydrogens, lone pairs, blah, blah, blah. Then Chem 222, we started getting into organic chemistry, and we started to, well, maybe we won't show all the lone 
compared. And then I showed you about the line structures, and then we didn't show carbons or hydrogens. Well, the next version of that is what they call ribbon notation. And this little ribbon right here is the CH2CH2 between the nitrogens on ethylene diamine. And the ribbon way is just a way to focus more on the geometry of the molecule without being bogged down by all the atoms. So this is a cobalt ion with three ethylene diamines. So each of these blue dots right here would essentially be the nitrogen with its teeth connecting to the cobalt. And this part right here would be the CH2CH2. And again, no hydrogens are showing, stuff like that. Um, ribbon becomes really important when you start getting into biomolecules. So if you're planning on doing biochemistry, you'll see more ribbons coming up. Here's an example of a uh, three orthophenanthroline compound I found. Uh, this is an iron plus two compound. And in the middle, that kind of red atom right there, that's the, orth that's the iron. And then here's an orthophenanthroline, there's one above and one below. It's a huge molecule. Some people call this the propellerine molecule because it looks like a propeller on a ship. Uh, but it's pretty uh, interesting. But anyway, this is a very massive molecule. It would be difficult, I would think, to get the iron to do a lot just because there's not a lot of necessarily room for other things to happen. But it's still kind of fascinating, at least to nerdy chemists like me. Now, another la uh, bidentate ligand that we will see next week in lab, the QA3 lab, is uh, we're going to use a compound called dimethylglyoxine. And so people abbreviated DMG. But the important thing is that, well, first of all, it's bidentate. So in this compound with nickel, which is what DMG is famous for, the nickel is bonded to two nitrogens in the DMG molecule. So you can have two dimethylglyoxines. This is a square planar complex ion, by the way. But anyway, the nickel's in the middle. The D one DMG is like right here, and the other one is right here. So this molecule is actually flat. It's two-dimensional. And when you add nickel 2 plus to DMG, it makes kind of a cool rose color. You'll see this in lab next week, which is pretty spectacular. But anyway, uh, this is just another example of a bidentate ligand. Now, if you look here on the extremes, though, we have an OH and then dot, 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 dot kind of thing connected to an oxygen. Now, this is not a complex ion connection. What kind of connection do you think this might be up here based on Chem 222? Yes, well done. Hydrogen bond, well done. Hydrogen bonds, super strong. Hydrogen bonds are when you have a hydrogen connected to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, and the hydrogen connects to a second one. So this OH hydrogen can connect to another one. That's right. This actually stabilizes this flat molecule, keeps it kind of on the level part. Any questions on so remember this next week when you're in lab. It's a fun lab, I promise. Anyway. Okay, so here's the structure. Ethylene glycol, all right? Kind of antifreeze and stuff like that. Ethylene glycol also has a two-carbon system, and there's oxygens on the end. Looking at this structure, do you think it's monodente, bidente, tri, tetra, or <laughs> zero dente, which by the way doesn't exist, that's Michael's made up name. But look at the number of lone pairs on this molecule, all right? How many places do you think ethylene glycol could connect to a metal center? Two, right, excellent, <laughs> excellent, that's a perfect answer, yeah. I would say, uh, Bethany, since no one else had any auto, I think that no one else was uh, brave enough to say anything, I would say, Bethany and the rest of you, that this would be a bidentate ligand, all right? Um, I wouldn't include both lone pairs, but I would certainly include one, and one of these, 
doesn't, who knows which one, would connect to the metal, and this one in theory could wrap around and do the other one too. So I would probably call this a bidentate ligand because there's two possible lone pair places. Um, each lone pair doesn't probably count because there's not enough room for them to like make the connection. But it's kind of, yeah. Questions? The most famous uh, polydentate ligand of all is one that you may have heard of, you may have used before, it's hard to say. And it's called EDTA. And EDTA is a true polydentate ligand. So poly means many places to connect to a metal. And EDTA can literally wrap itself around a metal and pull it out of solution, which is pretty cool. Most metals on the transition metal, it will form one-to-one -one complexes. So you have platinum, palladium, zinc, gold, whatever, bismuth. Most complexes, one EDTA will wrap itself around one metal atom. It doesn't do a good job with group 1A, which are sodium, potassium, lithium, those guys. Those guys are too positive and too reactive, I guess. But everything else, it does a really good job. If you want to have uh, metal extracted from your solution, EDTA is a great thing to put in because EDTA will go in, it wraps itself around the metal, and in theory then, you can pull that complex ion out. Maybe if you're lucky, you can filter it, or maybe there's some kind of other chemical thing you can do. But EDTA is a very common scavenger of metals. It has a very high formation constants. That's the KF equilibrium expression. And what that tells you is that EDTA plus metal making these complexes, they want to form, all right? They're not going to sit idly on the side. They're going to come together and they're going to happen. Um, it's a primary standard, and this is something we haven't talked about too much, but a primary standard means you can literally just add it straight from the bottle and it's good to go. You don't have to heat it up to get rid of water. You don't have to purify it usually. It's a very stable material, and so most of the time it's a nice thing if you want to add it into it. But the best thing about EDTA, in my opinion, the movie Blake. No! Oh, son of a, I didn't the Oh, you're right. Okay, guys, just uh, talk amongst yourselves for a second. Ah, oh, son of a God, to change this. See, all that, good, like, all that good setup and stuff. Totally cool. All right, let me try that one more time. All right, uh, it's really cool. EDTA is awesome. Stable complexes in the movie you play. There. So what's all of this? Took a trip to the hospital last night. Got some equipment. Your miracle cure. This is EDTA. It's an anticoagulant. We use it to treat blood clots. Now look what happens when I introduce it onto a sample of vampire blood. Take a step back. This is the first blade. The reaction is energetic. Wesley's side. So in this admittedly very cheesy movie and stuff, uh, EDTA was used to attack the vampires. And vampire blood, supposedly, when the EDTA came around it, it surrounded it, made them explode and stuff like that. All right, that's way too much fun for EDTA. But if you do see that movie, uh, and the Blade 2 mentioned it a little bit, but Blade 1 was the main one. It's pretty cool. They're remaking Blade. I'm very excited about that. Blade has always been one of my heroes. Of anyway, you have better things to do than watch my bad references to movie. Here's the actual EDTA molecule. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Okay? So ethylene diamine is very similar to what we saw earlier. Ethylene was a two carbon system. Diamine means two nitrogens. But this one is a little bit of an extension. It's a tetraacetic acid. Now we've seen that acetic acid is CH3 COOH. All right. Now, so each of these here is like an acetic acid. 
So this one is up to a hexa-coordinate, hexadentate ligand because there's potentially six places that it can wrap itself around a metal. So if your metal is only needs two places, no problem. It's got two, it's got more than two. On the other hand, if you've got an octahedral metal, no problem. It totally wraps itself around, connects at each one of those spots, and that's why it's so good about taking it out. Now this is the basic form of EDTA because it's not showing any hydrogens and stuff like that. So sometimes you have to play with the pH a little bit. But either way you can see how there's six possible places that the metal can be attacked, if you will. So the EDTA can literally pull the metal right out of your solution if you wish to. This is a cobalt EDTA complex, all right? And in this, this is what happens when you start adding all the atoms and it gets very confusing. The M is the metal and stuff, and you can see that there's the nitrogens, the reds or the oxygens, et cetera, et cetera. The ribbon makes it a lot easier to see. So here's the cobalt again. Remember, red is oxygen and the blues are nitrogen. This whole thing is one EDTA that's wrapping itself around the cobalt ion. Um, so it's pretty cool. This one has a negative charge overall. Um, each of the oxygens is potentially a negative one. So that means negative four. This must be a cobalt three plus. But anyway, you get the idea. You can then sometimes pull it out or wash the EDTA out of the system. These are some examples of formation constants, and they're so big that people usually take a logarithm of those. So the bigger the log, these are powers of 10, they're huge, huge numbers. But anyway, the important part here is that all of these are positive numbers, they're all much greater than one. So that means when you have some barium and you add EDTA, it forms right away, all right? It's very, very product favored. Nothing's gonna stop it. But barium's one of the lower ones. I mean, some of these are in the 20s and stuff. Um, EDTA is used a lot to extract iron from things. So like a lot of times our water sources will have iron in them, especially back east with rusty pipes and stuff. So EDTA will take the iron out of your water if that's important, and it does it amazingly well since it has a high cost. Any questions? Okay. There's lots of other examples of polydentate ligands or chelating agents. This is porphine, all right? It's a, used in nature, and again, I'll let you biology people here talk more about it. This is an example of what it looks like before, and this is with an iron. Now in this example, the nitrogens right here are ready to rock and roll. These nitrogens might have had to have a hydrogen extracted, all right, some of it, so that's where the positive part might come from, but you get the idea. Um, myoglobin, which is used, of course, in our bodies, is super important. It keeps the oxygens around. Um, huge, huge molecules, once again. Uh, when you start getting into biochemistry, the molar masses are easily in the thousands sometimes. But again, with this kind of quasi-ribbon theory, and you can see the thing is rotating on itself, then you can focus on that. Here's the iron, and it's got the oxygen right there, and that iron is connected over here by some kind of Lewis space nitrogen system. Uh, heme, of course, which is transporting our oxygen in our bodies, is super important. Oxohemoglobin, blah, 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 is really good. And again, it's nothing more than an iron center. That's the Lewis acid. There's oxygen that can connect here. All right, it can be uh, relatively easily kicked off if you want to. So the oxygen can go around our bodies. And again, the nitrogens around here are what kind of keep it in place. Uh, you'll understand maybe this joke now a little bit better if you ever see this on the internet. These memes are going around for a long time. There's so many different variations of them, but this one as a chemist really picked my interest. So first of all, iron hemoglobin likes oxygen. That's what keeps our bodies going. But if you ever are around carbon monoxide, uh, of course it's deadly. Carbon monoxide attracts iron a lot more than poor oxygen here. So when hemoglobin sees carbon monoxide, it's like, all right, of course, that's what kills us and stuff like that. I have a strange sense of humor, but anyway. All right. Uh, this will be a good place to take a break. Uh, it's about 9.50, so about 9.55 we'll start up again. So stretch your legs, check your phone.